If you are a professional video content creator, videographer, or filmmaker, then you may have come across the Lumix S5 from Panasonic, a compact, lightweight, full-frame system with a 4K internal video recording in 10-bit 422, as well as slow motion, vlog, all those bells and whistles that a professional would need. There were still some features that the public really, really wanted the S5 to have. And now, Lumix themselves have answered those prayers by introducing the Lumix S5 II. What this video is looking to achieve is to introduce and just get you familiar with the layout of this camera. So I'm gonna be going over the buttons across the body, showing you what all the ports are, where they are, uh, what cards it takes, what battery it takes, all those sorts of things. And then we're gonna be taking a deeper dive into the menu system, just to get you familiar with how to navigate all of those settings. So first things first, I just want to highlight to you guys that if you are familiar with the Lumix S5 I already in terms of its button layout and everything and all that sort of stuff, then there's not much I can show you in this section of the video because all of the buttons around this body are identical to the Lumix S5 I. Okay, so all those buttons are the same. So if you already are familiar with those buttons, there's nothing new. So if I were you, I would go ahead and skip to the next chapter of this video. So here we go with the Lumix S5 II. Straight away you can see that we have our first function buttons. This is a button that you can assign. It is preview mode set as default, but you can assign that as to anything you like that is convenient to you through the menu system. And here we have our you know, like sensor plate release button. Without holding this down, you won't be able to take this off as a safety measure, which is rather nice. It just clicks into place like that which leaves you feeling that it is very secure. And now looking at the back of the camera, we have our playback button. This is where you can go to see all of your recorded media, all of your photos, all of that stuff. And here is our LVF button. So that's how you can, that's how you can switch from it being auto between either your eyepiece or your monitor, or you can like set it yourself. You just toggle through and it will go from here to here to auto, to here to here to auto, that sort of thing. You just toggle through until you find the setting that best suits you. And looking over on this side of the back of the body, we have our AF mode button um, encapsulated by our focus mode lever. So if we look over onto this little bit over here, you can see we've got C for continuous, MF for manual focus, and then S for, well, something else. But generally, if you leave it on C for continuous, that will generally be all that you need if you're relying on autofocus. Or obviously, if you just want manual focus, you just switch to that. We also have our AF on button. So this is where you can just switch your AF on. And then we've got this dial here, which is also a button. You can like press it in and everything. And you can use this to navigate the menu system. You can also use it to control the um, selected area that you would like to focus on. And then here we have our quick menu button. So you just press that to get to your quick menu where you can get to all of your quick and easy access items that you can assign there in the menu system. And then here we have our menu button circulated by a uh, directional pad as well as this functional dial here, which we'll use for various settings that we can assign ourselves. But basically you use the D-pad to navigate uh, the menu button to open the menu first of all, but then obviously it's set as well. So you can also use that to select various parts of the menu, which I shall show you in due time. And you've also got your display button here where you can cycle through um, various forms of display that you like. So if you want all the furniture on your screen, then uh, the display button can offer that up to you, but it can also take it away. It's whatever is comfortable for you, really. And then here we've got our cancel, but also our delete button. It becomes a delete button when you go into the playback menu in case you want to delete any clips that you would like removed. Um, but in the menu system, it'll just be your back button, but also to cancel any settings that you're about to select, say like the format card button. If you're not intending to format your card, then the this button is uh, your safety net to get you out of there without accidentally saying, yes, okay, I'll select those cards, please. It is a fully articulating screen, you'll be happy to know. It's also touch screen, which I shall show you in a moment. And obviously by flipping it inwards and then closing it, you're, com you're 
protecting that uh, that monitor right there from any scratches, any dust, or any extra muck that might get on there. Now coming to the top of the body. Here is where you can see your on and off switch right here. It is currently set to on, but because it's been inactive, it has auto powered off by now. But if I just switch that back to off, then that's a safer measure. We've also got our record button, the nice red record button, so that you know that it's your record button. Um, and also just above that, we've got our white balance button, our ISO, and also our exposure compensation button as well and then here's our shutter button for any photos you might be taking for that traditional you know photo button feel that you photographers out there might like and there's also a dial here as well which will be coming useful for our exposure controls later and now just getting a closer look this is our mode dial so it's currently set to um, movie mode at the moment um, after that we've got s and q which stands for slow and quick motion so that's how you get your slow motion settings where it removes the audio for you, but you can get some nice slow-mo, but you can also get quick motion down to one frame per second. So a very easy way to get like a kind of time-lapse effect, if that's the sort of thing you're going for. And then following that, we've got our custom mode uh, settings where we have three to play with. So if you've got three lots of settings that you would like to have ready to go, so you can just switch to on the fly as and when you need them, then you can uh, navigate to these in the menu and then basically customize them to whatever it is that you would like them to be. Then we've got IA followed by program mode. Program mode is the photography mode that beginners would typically use. Um, this is basically like, it'll, it'll sort out all the aperture and shutter set and settings for you, um, depending on what it is that you're framing up. So it'll take into account all the lighting and the situation that you're in, and it will take a photo that it's been programmed to take, making best use of both shutter and aperture to get you the cleanest shot possible. And then you've got aperture priority. Um, if you want to take full control of your aperture, get some shallow depth of field, make sure you've got deep depth of field, whichever it is that you're after, and it'll just alter your ISO or shutter to make sure that it's exposed correctly. And then also vice versa. If you wanted to prioritize your shutter, then you've got shutter priority here as well. And for the masters of photography or those who just want full control, you have manual here too, but we shall be leaving this on movie mode because I am a videographer and that is what I would be using this camera for in the first place. That and S and Q or any of the custom modes that I set to get various, you know, different flavors of video that I can switch to on the go as and when I need them. And now looking over to the drive mode dial, we've got all the usual suspects. Um, for all of our photography needs, timers and, uh, you know, continuous burst rates and all of that. Coming over to this, the hot shoe, it does have a plate over it to stop it from getting dust logged or anything like that, but you can just take that off and move it aside. And then here is your hot shoe ready for mounting your XLR adapter as and when you need it. And now coming over to the SD card slots, if we just pop this open, we can see we have two SDXC2 card slots, so you can get those good high bitrate video recording modes straight into this camera via two card slots. And you can either dual record these, so you've got one as backup, or you can have it just so that you record into one and then it starts recording into the other when the first one is full. And then you can keep like swapping them over to basically get continuous recording on the go forever, if you really need it, considering you've got the battery power you know, power source stuff to keep it going at the same time. And now on the other side of this camera, if I just show you the 3.5 millimeter ports that we have, we've got one for our microphone input and one for our headphone output. So you don't need the XLR adapter um, stuck to the top of this camera in order to record good, clean audio. You can use 3.5 millimeter jack microphones into this and then obviously headphones. Just make sure you've got some nice headphones so that you can monitor that audio to ensure that you're getting the quality that you're after. Now, this is an improvement over the previous generation of the S5. We now have a full HDMI port for your external monitors, external recorders, all of that malarkey. And also we have a USB-C port right here, which can be used to um, connect it up to charge those batteries internally inside the camera. And also if you get the S5 2X, you can also take advantage of recording straight into an SSD T5 drive. So bypassing SDXC2 cards 
altogether, just getting one drive, you can get like 500 gigabytes, uh, one terabyte of space, and then record into that. And now coming to the bottom of the S5 II, here is our tripod mount, where you would expect it to be, just so that you know that it's there. Then up here, we have our battery compartment, just a switch, and then it flips open. And then another little gray switch, you just push that in, then out comes the battery. Now this is the same battery as is used in the S5 I, but also in the GH5s as well. It is an upgrade from a previous generation of battery. It just gives more power um, and just uh, gives more life to your camera for longer. So if you've already got these kinds of batteries, then you can just keep using those. And also you get a battery with this camera as well. So that's just another battery to your arsenal to keep your cameras running for as long as you need them to run. Now we're going to take a deep dive into the menu system just to get you familiar with what the layout of the menu is and what sort of settings it offers and gives you control over. This is uh, the general furniture that you'll see when you first come to open up um, the camera, not open up the camera, but turn it on. It shows you what your uh, white balance is in Kelvin. It shows you what picture profile you are in. It shows whether you're shooting in MOV, which we currently are, 4K, 422, uh, 10, long up, 25p, all that stuff. So just to give you a glimpse at the quick menu, if I just go ahead and hit the Q button, that'll take us to our quick menu uh, page. Here we can switch from MOV to MP4. We just use this dial at the top here if we want to switch it as you can see as I roll this it'll roll between and go down here we use the dial to navigate through all our different like um, uh, shooting formats so if I just you know it's just a really easy way to just navigate through and see all of those we've got our picture profiles here as well or photo styles if you like uh, so we've got photo style standard we've got vivid we've got natural we've got L classic neo we've got flat we've got landscape We've got portrait, we've got monochrome for your black and white shooters. We've got L monochrome and we've got L monochrome D. We've got L monochrome S. And then we've got cine like D2 for those that don't want to shoot in full flat. I, w I used to shoot in this all the time just to get a slightly flatter picture without going full log because I didn't always want to be editing my videos if I knew it was just going to be basically an extra step that I didn't necessarily need for my day-to-day -day shooting. And then we've also got cine like V2. We've got like 709, which is basically just 709. And then we've got Vlog, which is um, the more professional format that I think most videographers or content creators shoot in. Um, just gives you more dynamic range and more control over your colors, your saturation, your, your contrast. If you wanted a flatter look, then this is how you would go about it. But I would recommend grading it a little bit at least, just so it doesn't look so gray. Just bring some of the color back to everyone's cheeks, that's all. And then we've got real-time LUT. This is the photo style, as I'll now call it from now on for this camera, or picture profile, probably slip it from time to time. This is the photo style that when you bring in your own LUTs and you want to shoot in a LUT that you have imported into this camera, this is the mode that you will use to basically burn that LUT into your photo. So it's basically like shooting in V-Log and then adding the LUT later in post. This is just a quick way to add the LUT while you're shooting so that when you basically offload all of your footage, it's ready to go with your LUT baked into it. But it does mean that you do sacrifice having the V-Log file in case you did want to grade it differently later. Um, but it's entirely up to you. If you know how you like to work, then this is a nice way to just kind of skip that step in post. And then we've got like 2100 HLG. We've got my photo style one, my photo style two, and my photo style three, followed by my photo style four. But moving on from the quick menu, now you know what your photo styles are, so I won't bore you too much with that stuff. Um, just to give you a quick glimpse at the display button, if I just go ahead and press that, it will give you an idea of what happens. It basically just like cycles through different ways of previewing uh, your monitor. So right now we're just looking at what photographers might more keenly like to keep an eye on. It obviously highlights all of your, your, your more important features, like what your shutter speed is, what your ISO is, what 
photo style you're in, what your iris is. It's at zero at the moment because we don't have a lens attached to this thing and also white balance and frames per second as well. If I cycle back, it now goes to black and then we bring it back and it's got all those details ready on the screen. This right here is a waveform monitor or a vector scope or whichever, whichever one of those it is, basically to help you keep an eye on your exposure so you don't underexpose or overexpose. Obviously, we're very underexposed here, but as I said, it's because we've not got a lens on here and I do have the lens cap on the front of the body. So literally no light is getting in at all. So it literally is seeing black as is as is being uh, communicated by uh, this little scope right here. And obviously if I hit display again, it just takes it away, just gives you a cleaner part of the image. And obviously here I can like move this little box around. So obviously if we do have our autofocus engaged right now, then we could basically use this to, um, you know, see all that business. Now if I just cycle back through, so we've got all that. Now we're gonna dive into the menu. So we just go ahead and hit our menu slash set button. And here you go, this is what it looks like. It's very neat and tidy. We've got um, various like kind of master folders for each kind of like section and it's all touch screen as well. So you can navigate it very quickly or you could just use the dials here just to get through. It's very intuitive. You just kind of step inwards using the arrow keys just to get closer in and all that kind of stuff. Here's our playback modes and everything. We will get to that in a moment. So you can see everything in one go, go down if you need to, go down again to the next one. It's just that as you get familiar with these menus, you'll be able to step into things really quickly and efficiently and find what you need uh, as you need it, basically. Here we have our exposure mode. So what kind of exposure mode do you want to work with? Do you want it to be manual? Do you want it to be shutter priority, um, aperture priority, program mode? Uh, generally speaking, as a video shooter, you want manual. So you set that to manual. Then you've got photo style, which we saw in the quick menu and quickly went through. Here you can kind of cycle through and, you know, it's just a different way of looking at it. We've got our metering modes. So, you know, for those that use metering modes, we've got those available. We can switch between the different ones here. We've got dual native ISO setting, which is, you know, you can have it on auto or you can have it on low or high. You probably want to set it to auto because it has the dual native ISO. It will switch to the, the most efficient one. Um, depending on your lighting situation, how much ISO you're using to make sure that you're getting, you know, the best, uh, you know, uh, contrast to noise ratio for your shooting. And then you've got ISO sensitivity right here. And then you've got synchro scan. Synchro scan is basically how you can adjust um, how the sensor scans that lighting to hopefully cancel out that flicker for any of the lights that you have on the location that you are shooting in so it doesn't kind of interfere with any of your photos or your video or any of that kind of stuff. And then we can just come out of that and go to image quality two. And then here we've got um, shutter speed or gain operation. If we just dive into that, we can see we've got um, uh, second ISO, angle ISO, uh, second dB. <laughs> I always go angle ISO. I think angle ISO is just better. And then we've got various other grayed out things as well. Color shading compensation. You can, you know, if you know what to do with that, you can do some stuff with that. Filter settings, if you want, there it is. And then in here, this is, where a lot of your kind of like decision making on what kind of picture you want to film is going to be. So we've got rec file format. So you can, you've got the options of MAV or MP4. And then down here, we've got image area of video. So you can go full frame or you can go APS-C or you can go pixel pixel. Full frame is usually where you want to be, but you know, you might occasionally need to go APS-C depending on what shooting mode that you're going to be in, but also what kind of lenses you're going to be using as well. There are some really good lenses out there that are APS-C that you might want to pair with the Lumix S5 too. So, you know, cropping in like that just means you don't have to do it in post. It means you save uh, so much resolution because you'll be shooting in 4K as well anyway. It just crops in on that sensor a little bit to accommodate for those lenses or shooting modes, whichever it is that you need it for. And then in here, record quality, this is where your resolutions and your various kind of like, uh, whether it's in 10 bit 422 or whether you're at 25 frames per second or 50 frames per second, this is where a lot of this happens. So, you know, you've got loads of options to choose from. You can even just go down to um, just full HD if you want, you know, 1080p by 10, um, 1080p by 1920, uh, 
you know sometimes you might not be wanting to record in 4k and so going to you know just hd would be useful whether it's to do with saving on card space or just you know not needing to process 4k for your edit you know whatever's efficient for you like um the reason you get so many options in here is because there are just like so many variables to do with like uh, what you actually want to get out of what you are filming but you can also go up to uh, 6k here and, uh, you know, that's very good because you've got so much more resolution. Well, that's 5.9K. You've got 3.3K for anamorphic shooting. So if you're using anamorphic lenses, this is a really good one for that. And you've got so many resolutions to choose from all the way up to 6K. And, of course, you've got like, uh, you've got like uh, Cine 4K as well as just 4K, which is your more kind of like UHD um shooting formats so you know loads of options to choose from in a mixture of you know 10 bit 420 10 bit 422 420 full on 8 bit kind of stuff as well so yeah loads of options to choose from and then obviously you've got time code here which is really useful for if you're shooting with like external audio if you're shooting with multi cameras if you can set like your time code and sync everything up it just saves you so much time in post production um, meaning that, you know, you just sync everything up in one go without really having to do it by eye in the edit. Um, clapper boards are really good for that if you don't want to use your time code or anything. But, you know, if you've got a soundy, who knows what they're doing, you can have set it to free run or just, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you can have it on if you want, or you can switch it off. I will probably always have it on because it's, it's nice to see it. HDMI... Uh, time code output yeah why not send it to your external monitor keep it all synced up so you can see exactly what your time codes are across everything that you're shooting i think that's a really good feature to have makes this a very professional camera actually especially with like having cine 4k and all of that in 10 bit it's very nice to have and then we've got our focus menu so af detection setting unfortunately that is grayed out and off at the moment but you know detecting subject do you want a human do you want a full-on human or do you want face eye recognition? Like, what is it looking for? You've got animal and human, so it can, like, focus to animals, prioritize animals. And then you've got continuous AF uh, mode 2. Mode 2 is the one that I see in use more often than not. Uh, you can have it off completely, but, you know, mode 2, really good to go. It works all the time. It tells you right here what it actually does. Continuous AF only works while recording. I don't know why you would only want it to work while recording. I would have thought that if you're setting up a shot, of course you want it. You want to see if, if your subject is in focus before you hit record, because you want to reassure them they're in focus. But also if you're filming yourself, you want to reaffirm to yourself that you're in focus. Um, and then you've got AS, AF assist light and all that stuff. You can turn that on and off focus peaking have that on that's always very handy to have if you're manual focusing to something because it just means that you have that um that visual guide as to what is sharp and what is not one area af moving speed fast or normal uh, yeah, i suppose it's just like do you want it to slowly focus towards something or quickly I suppose the faster the better in most circumstances, but if you want things to be more organic, more natural, then normal might be a way to go. And then down here we've got audio one. So sound recording, level display, yes please. I always want to know whether or not my audio is peaking. I've got it on this camera I'm recording on right now, just so I can record, you know, make sure that my audio isn't like distorting at the top of those levels, but also making sure that my levels aren't too low either. Uh, just making sure that everything is audible. Mute sound input. Uh, you've also got sound rec gain. So you have it to standard or you can have it to low. I guess it depends like what equipment you're using. And then you've got sound level adjust. So this is just like if you're if you're working with um, your 3.5 millimeter jack microphone or, or just using the scratch audio from the microphones built into this camera, um, you can control those levels from here but obviously once you get to below minus 18 decibels it just goes straight to mute so if you didn't want any audio at all i guess that's a good way to just making sure you don't get any but i think those audio channels would still exist so you might as well have a little bit of scratch audio on there even if it is just like around i don't know like let's just say like minus 12 
and then you've got sound rack quality. Uh, this would come into effect when you have the XLR adapter fitted to the top of this camera. Um, so, uh, you know, once you've got that fitted in, you'd be able to see that you've got your 48 kilohertz, 24 bit audio, because that is generally a higher quality audio than what you would get through the 3.5 millimeter jack. That's literally the benefit of using the XLR adapter in the first place. And then you've got sound rack level limiter. Uh, you, the limiter is good because it means that if things do peak up a bit, say like if I get really loud very quickly, then it, it does keep those levels in check to make sure that you don't distort as much as you might have if you did not have that limiter um, you know, working for you. And also wind noise cancellation, you can set an intensity to that or you just switch it off completely if you're not too bothered about any wind disturbance at all. And then mic socket. Right, so we've got mic socket plug-in power. Mic socket works as mic input. Power is supplied <laughs> to an external mic by the camera. Yeah, very interesting. You've got all these different settings and line as well. Yeah, very good. Mic socket works as line input. Power is not supplied to an external device by the camera. Wow, that is, yeah, that's pretty handy. And then audio too. So we got special mic, I guess like, you know, when you've got your XLRs and everything, XLR adapter on here and everything, it gives you a bunch more channels. So like um, for here, you can set it so that while you've got your, oh, sorry, don't know what's going on there. While you've got your XLR working with your microphones, you can also set it so you still get scratch audio from the, uh, from the uh, the the camera itself so the internal inbuilt microphones will still be recording at the same time sound output real time yeah i, I would have thought so you got real time or you got rec sound it, it does give you a description of what these mean um, monitor real time sound or output sound that will be recorded on video so i guess that means like as you're recording you can monitor it um, again, I would just leave it as real time. Headphone volumes, so this is like for your monitoring. It does not affect the input of the audio, but say like you really want to hear what's going on. It's a very noisy day. You might want to set it up really high, although you, you know, look after your ears, everybody. You don't want to be, you know, getting deaf by the age of 40. Um, and obviously like if you only need to just know that it's on, then have it at a lower level. But Yes, very good to have this uh, volume dial here, just so you can kind of check it in and make sure you're getting everything you need. Sound monitoring channel. So here's where you can like choose which channels you want to be taking in. Um, yeah, very good to have all these choices. And then coming out of here, we now have others. So these are all just the kind of miscellaneous settings. So we've got silent mode on, or, you know, if you want it to be silent, I guess that means like um, when you press record or anything like that, you tend to have like a sound that indicates that it's now recording or stopped recording or taking a photo, you know, it has like an artificial click sound. A lot of these mirrorless cameras do these days, but you can switch that off so you can always be uh, dead quiet while filming. Say like you're filming a documentary or anything like that would be very good for that. Image stabilizer, you've got various settings here. This is how you get to those. Um, so yeah, you just kind of jump into these and you choose which of these you would like to take into use, um, you know, turn on all the extra, you know, image stabilization that you need, anamorphic, yeah, you can dial up like how much stabilization you need. Uh, you do wanna be conscious of uh, the warp stabilization that happens when you activate some of these, it can make some of your shots look like jelly. Then you got self timer setting, um, if you use self timers for your video or anything like that, and uh, focus transition, loop recording video, um, segmented file recording. So like this splits up your files um, by however long you want them to stretch for. Um, this camera does record continuously. So if you did want everything in one massive file, then you can have that. But say like uh, you wanted to record in segments for whatever reason, like it, it's better for your workflow or something like that. Like I know sometimes one massive file can really slow down your editing as opposed to having uh, multiple three minute files, for instance. Uh, generally, I'm expecting people will have this off because having the continuous recording is really useful. And you can transcode those big files to become smaller ones in terms of like the actual file size, but the runtime still is the whole stretch of the, the entire recording. But y you know, th th there's, this is a nice workaround as well if you want to control it in camera. Live cropping. Um, yeah, there it is. <laughs> 
and uh, then we can come over to our our little um, cog part of the menu. So this is a new chapter, and in here we now have lens uh, slash others. So if I take us all the way to the top of here, we'll take it from the top. It looks like there's a lot more going on in this menu than there was the previous one. So here we have our, if I just go in, photo style settings. So show hide photo style. So, you know, if there's any photo styles you, you just know for a fact you're never going to use, you can just switch these off, set, set them to off, and they won't even appear when you go to look for a photo style, basically. So, yeah, they're never in the way. It means you can get to the photo styles you actually like to use a lot quicker because you're cycling through a lot less options. My photo style settings. So this is where you can load a preset setting or add an effect and then reset photo style. That's if you've altered any photo styles and you want to revert it back to the default. Now, LUT library. Um, oh, hello. Uh, LUT library. This is where you can uh, set all of your LUTs. You can load them in through your um, SD cards or through the USB-C port to install them onto this camera. Then you've got your selection of all of them in here. You've got uh, your, your Vlog 709 here as a standard. So like um, if you're shooting in, in, in Vlog, but you want to apply that 709 to it straight out of the camera, then that's what you can do in here. Um, ISO increments, um, there you go. You can either go by ones or you can go by thirds. Going by um, smaller increments, I would advise, is always a little bit better because it just gives you more options. Extended ISO, um, why not? Why wouldn't you have that on? <laughs> I'll leave it as off for now. Um, here's your exposure offset. So uh, multimetering, uh, center weighted, spot highlighted, weighted, you know, if you, if you do do exposure offset adjustments at all, then you can do a bit of work in here to make full use of that. Face priority in multimetering on, you can either switch that off or on if you like. Um, auto white balance lock setting, um, operation sync with shutter. You know, there's a lot going on in this camera. So many options to keep you busy. And then not only is this page one, but now we've got page two of this. We just hold, we just go down on the D-pad and it takes us to the second page of this where we now have exposure comp reset on. Uh, we've got auto exposure in PASM and we've got creative video combined set where we've got a bunch of different options right here. Focus slash shutter, focus shutter priority, AFS focus. Do, do, do. Manual focus assist for anyone who likes to be assisted in their manual focusing. I think um, for a lot of professionals, they might not want the assistance because sometimes when you're um, manual focusing, you want to be precise in the way that you move. And sometimes um, assistance from a camera can get in the way of that. Sorry about that. Um, manual focus guide, focus ring lock, um, show or hide AF mode. So like, again, you can hide various different modes that you know you will never be using. And if we go down, it'll take us to the next focus shutter. I'm just gonna cycle through these quickly, um, just to give you an idea. So just so you can see what's here, Obviously the ones that are greyed out, uh, I'm afraid I can't dive into those for you, but a lot of these, it's, it looks like it is just on or off for a lot of them. Enlarge live display video. And then operation. So we've got quick menu settings. So layout style, mode one or mode two. Here's what the preview of those look like. So you can choose your favorite. I think mode one's pretty good because it means you get a really good preview of what it is you're actually shooting whilst obviously adjusting all the little, um, all the little <laughs> quick menu settings. And then front dial assignment, uh, item value. Um, these are things that you can play around with to really customize this camera and make it your own. Item customize photo, item customize video. So here is where you can now 
switch around all your different things. I'm in the photo one at the moment. So uh, if I want to say go to contrast, I want to change the contrast. I can now switch that to be something else entirely, but I can also just cancel that now and come out. And you can, then you can do the same for video as well. Cause in video you've got exposure mode, you've got your rec file, all that stuff. All the stuff that we saw earlier, photo style we saw earlier, and then uh, we can come out of that. Touch settings, because it's touch screen, there might be various things that you like about touch screen, some things you don't like about touch screen. So this is where you can customize all the touch screen stuff. So touch screen on, touch tab, uh, touch AF. Touch AF is very good for if you basically just want to quickly select a target on your screen as to you know get the camera to focus to that point. And then touch pad is, uh, yeah, is, uh, yeah. Function button set. So we've got some function buttons we can play around with. So in record mode, um, so you can set them for when you're in record mode and then set them for when you're in play mode. Um, so play mode is when you go to playback menu and then your function buttons will have different functions depending on which of these modes you're in. So record mode is obviously just a standard mode when you're actually filming stuff. So setting in record mode, here's basically the layout of the camera and all of its buttons. And you can reassign those buttons to do different things. So if I just cycle through these, if I say want to change the LVF slash monitor button to something else, then I have full control to do that. I can make it another record button if I would like to. I can also um, go through this entire menu and go to histogram. So I can like use it to toggle on and off my histogram. Uh, luminance spot meter, frame marker, photo grid line. I've got so many options. I've got red light. <laughs> I've got red night mode. <laughs> I've got zebra patterns if I want to toggle off any zebras to assist with my exposure control. Loads of different options. Anamorphic squeeze, color bars. And, and then we've got uh, waveform monitor as well as vector scope here. Very good to use for your exposure control and all of that. Focus ring control. Man, there's just so much packed into this. Uh, destination card slot. Wi-Fi fan mode. Yeah, um, I'm just going to cancel out of this because I don't actually want to change anything right now. But, you know, you can see what you have at your fingertips right here. Um, quite a lot of customization. Even the buttons that you would think are, are like set for life, you can change. And it, you know, it shows you which, which of the buttons it's correlating to as well. So function two, you know, is on the front right next to the sensor, the top one, not the release plate one. And, you know, you can customize that to be whatever you would need it to be. And then we got white balance, ISO exposure button, all that stuff. <laughs> Just take your preference of what you would like that to be. And ISO displayed settings, like what do you want it to look like basically? Do you want ISO limit slash ISO, like hi, hi, can it go? Before it's ISO, um, ISO off, ISO, ISO, ISO. Yeah, so full customization of what your furniture on your monitor is gonna be, which is very nice to have. Exposure comp, display setting, cursor buttons, front rear dials. So you can now set what these do <laughs> for you. Dial set. So um, here you can assign what your dials do as well. Control dial assignment. So rotation F and shutter speed. Like which dial, like which dials and which directions do you want? Uh, rotation menu, menu operation. Yeah, you're getting very specific with um, what each of your buttons will be doing now. Joystick setting, uh, defocus movement, video rack button remote. Obviously, you just want that to be your record button, but, you know, it's giving you the option to switch it right here if you didn't want it to be that. Monitor display photo. So you've got auto review. You've got constant preview. You can set that if you like. Histogram on or off. Let's get out of there. At least it gives you a preview of it afterwards. Um, photo grid lines, you know, very good for helping with composition if you need help. But also you've got different versions of that, depending on how you want it, whether you want things to be very kind of like three by three grid or your spider web or, or this one. I suppose what this one would be good for is like, you know, I've seen a lot of like tele shopping channels where they will have 
like um, some graphics come on screen and it's usually in like this kind of L reverse L shaped bar sort of format where it kind of crops things over, but it's usually like an overlay. It doesn't shrink the image down to fit this. Like this is just an overlay that goes on top. So this is a very nice way to basically have those lines in place. So when you're setting your cameras, you can see, you can see, oh wow, you can, you can place these wherever you like. That is, that is really handy. That is really handy. Very nice. I will be setting that to off for now because I don't really use that stuff, but at least we know that it's there. That is very good. What does this one do then? Come on, I want to see it. Get me out. Okay, yeah, it, it's just like, it just gives you loads more lines to play with so you can see more or things to look out for, help you line your shots up a lot better. Live view boost. So live view boost. So mode one is the screen is displayed brighter. However, frame rate of LCD and LVF will slightly drop. Mode two is the screen displayed brighter than mode one. Frame rate of LCD and LVF will drop substantially. Off is feature disabled. And then you can set it yourself, I suppose. Um, Okay, you've got night mode, you've got LVF slash monitor display set. So yeah, you've got some uh, settings here to play with regarding that. Expo meter, you can have that on or off. And then next, focal length. It can tell you what your focal length is, or if you don't really care because you're just using your lens, and, you know, you probably know what you've zoomed it to or what prime lens you're using. So you probably just set that to off and it not bother anyone. But if you really wanted to know, you could just leave it on. Blinking highlights, sheer overlay, IS statoscope, level gauge, luminance spot meter, framing outline, show hide monitor layout. And then you've got monitor display video. So you've got your V-Log view assist, which is very handy for if you are shooting in log, but you want to see like some real contrast in what you're shooting. Sometimes it's very hard to get focus in log profiles because of how flat it is. It's very hard to see where those sharp edges are. So having a, a V-Log view assist is actually very handy. And you've got the same for HLG, high log gamma as well. You've got your anamorphic de-squeeze display. So like if you are using anamorphic lenses, you might might want to set it so that it squeezes the image for you otherwise you'll be looking at a very stretched out image yeah it'll be very very good to um, de-squeeze it um, while you're using the lenses in this camera and it's just a preview as well you do de-squeeze them in editing afterwards but at least this camera can give you a preview of what it will look like before you get it into post and then we have monochrome live view on or off. We've got center markers on or off. And you can, you've got a variety of different center markers to choose from in case you wanted a specific type. Safety zone markers. And then frame markers on or on. You could just have that to off, but you do have set to, you know, so you can see like uh, where your crop is if you're going to be shooting as if it were anamorphic, but, uh, you know, if it's not anamorphic. But, you know, that's really good to have. You can have it as a 100%, 75%, 50%, 25%. If I switch it on and come out, now I can see that I've got like a kind of a, a false anamorphic frame going on. So this kind of gives you that, that guide to, if you are shooting with the intention of faking that anamorphic look by just having black bars at the top and bottom of your frame in post-production, then this is a good way to kind of visualize that in your camera to make sure that you're getting the correct framing so that nothing gets kind of unnecessarily cropped out by accident or anything like that. And it's good that you can set like different crops as well. You can have a four by three crop, and one by one crop, so very handy, 16 by nine crop as well. But I don't know why you would necessarily need that because the majority of the time you are gonna be shooting in that anyway. But we don't need this for now. You can choose a, a color for it. You can also choose like a, a mask for it as well and set different like um, opacity percentages for it and all that. But we'll just have this off for now. Just switch that all the way off. Zebra pattern, on or off, uh, you know, you've got different types here. And then if we go down now, we've got waveform and vector scope. You can have that on or off. You can choose between one or the other. This will help you to really hone in on the correct exposure for particular shots. Color bars, if you need them. What that means is that you're gonna get a red box around, your, around the monitor so that you basically have that confirmation that you are in record. Um, but I will switch that off just because that's how it was. 
Um, HDMI rack output. So info. Do you want to send the info to the output? Um, you might do if you're just monitoring, but you might not if you just basically want like a clean feed to show to a director or a producer or anything like that. HDMI recording control on or off. Um, sound output. Do you want to output the sound via HDMI as well? Um, enlarged display on or off. Uh, fan mode, auto, all that kind of stuff. Take full control of the internal <laughs> heat control of your camera uh, via the fans that are built into this model. Coming to the lens slash other part of this part of the menu, we have lens focus resume on or off. We even has lens function button setting. So if your lens has a function button fitted to it, this is where you can assign what its job is. It is by default set to focus stop, but you do have like AF mode, uh, detection subject, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if if you wanted it to do something specific that's better tailored to how you like to work, then this is the part of the menu where you can access that. Restore to default, just in case you set it to something and don't know what its default function would be or would like it to go back to what it was, but you didn't know what it was in the first place. And then we've got micro AF micro adjustment. We have lens information. So lots of lens information in here for those that need it. And loads of grayed out ones, just in case you have any extra additions. You got lens info confirmation on or off, and you have vertical position info video in brackets. So very handy for anyone who is shooting in a vertical position. So that brings us out of the cog part of the menu. Now we're going into the spanner. And the first thing that we come up with is card slash file. So this is where you can format your cards if you have any. I don't have any cards in here right now, but this is where you would go. And then you've got double card slot function. So this is where you can choose whether you what your recording method is, whether you want it to like just record onto one card and then move to the other, whether you want both cards to like back up for for each other um, allocation rack. You can you, know, you can even set it so that you can shoot photos to one card and then video to another. So if you have two different cards, one that's better suited for video and you want to keep that free for, for the video stuff, but then you also have another card for photos, you can have it so that photos go into one card and then video goes into another. That is a very handy feature to have. And then destination card slot, two or one or one to two, like uh, whichever one you would like to whichever one you'd like to prioritize, really. And then file folder, file settings, uh, file number reset, in case you want to reset the, uh, the, the numberage of your, of your um, video files, photo files. So when it counts up to a certain number, you might want it to come back down to a lower number just because it looks tidier for whatever reason. Um, I'm sure people have better reasons than, than that, to be honest, out in the field. Copyright information. If you are an artist and you would like to set copyright, you can stick your name on there and then all that copyright will be embedded into the metadata of your photos and all that business, which is very handy for us artists out there. Monitor display, power save mode, thermal management, monitor frame rate. So, you know, 60 FPS, I would highly recommend. Um, LVF, um, similar story. Uh, monitor settings, uh, so this is like your brightness, and then uh, monitor backlight. So this is actually like for if you're, if you set it to auto, it'll auto adjust to basically the lighting of, of where you are. But sometimes you would like to keep it more consistent and keep more control. So this might be good for outdoors, keeping it at maximum brightness. But then, you know, as you go into lower light settings, you might want it to be a little bit dimmer because maybe if you're in a dark environment anyway having this really bright lcd monitor might be a bit too much for the human eye to handle for long periods of time so i set that just back to one eye sensor the sensitivity of that you can set it to high or to low and then lvf monitor switch uh this this correlates to the button that we have on the body of the camera just here the lvf button so i guess this is just a menu version of being able to cycle through that to get to you know so you can either prioritize the the monitor as we are doing or prioritize the lvf or prioritize like keep it auto so if you bring your eye to the lvf part here then it will automatically switch to that and switch the monitor off for you and then vice versa when you move your eye away from it and everything like that level gauge adjust Right, so we can adjust our, our level here. Ooh, hello. Um, I'm not going to go messing with that right now, but for those of you who know um, what to do with this, um, there it is. 
coming down to in slash out one. So we've got a beep control, we've got headphone volume control, sound monitoring channel, so you can choose all the different channels that you would like to be monitoring in your audio. You've got Wi-Fi here, so this is where you can set up all of your Wi-Fi needs, your Bluetooth in case you wanted to like connect it to your phone or anything like that, to use your phone as an external monitor or any of that business. USB, so power supply through via USB. I would say yes, because it would be a very good way to charge batteries without needing to use a battery charger. It also means you probably charge two batteries at the same time if you only got one charging port and then basically just put the other battery if you've got a second one in this camera to charge it via USB. And then of course you can like, you know, PC storage, like transfer data over PC tether, um, all that kind of stuff. And then we've got battery use priority. We've got HDMI connection. So you can get very in depth with like uh, all that kind of stuff here. And then into in slash out to network connection light on or off. So it's basically like an indication as to whether or not you're connected to the network at all. And then we're coming down to just, well, setting. So save to custom mode. So this is where you can alter each of your different custom modes. So if I go to custom mode one, overwrite current camera setting, uh, yes, please. And then basically that saves whatever setting that you currently had on this camera. So basically what you would wanna do if you wanted to set that is you wanna go through to whichever it is, go into your video settings, change around like uh, things like uh, what format you want to be saving your files in, do you want it to be full frame APS-C, what resolution do you want to use, and then also like what photo style that you would like to be using as well. And then once you've chosen all of those things, you can then bring that down to save to custom mode. And then you just click on the one that you want. It'll ask, do you want to overwrite this? And then when you hit yes, it will save that to that custom mode. So now all those settings that I currently have set in the uh, camera well just then that I just saved now when I switch it over to C1 when I switch it to this now it will basically go it will always revert back to those settings that I literally just saved through that part of the menu but now just switching it back to this so we can carry on with the menu thank you very much and here we can also load a custom mode as well so uh, load this mode to the current camera setting Custom mode settings, uh, limit number of custom mode. Um, okay, well, you can, yeah, do some stuff in here. You can give them titles if you like. So edit the title. If you wanna call this like your, your filmmaker mode, then call this one your photography mode. And then any of these other ones, just call them whatever names you like. Um, it just allows you to be more specific. Um, it also means if anybody picks up this camera, you can direct them to this part of the menu and then they can, I guess, they could see all of your different modes. And if they're using your equipment, you want them to be using certain settings, then you can say, can you use setting this, this, please? But in all honesty, I don't know why you wouldn't just tell them to go, could you just switch it to C2, please? Because that would be better for us in this situation. That would probably be a, a faster way of working, in my opinion. And then select loading details. Um, yeah, white balance, um, fr frame, shutter speed, ISO, sensitivity, uh, yeah. And then just a, a full reset rec settings if you feel like you went a step too far. And then others, so we have clock set. So if you need to set your, your date and time, you can do that in here. Uh, your time zone, um, you've got a nice little, <laughs> you've got a nice map here to show you like <laughs> what time zone you're in. We're in the UK, so we wanna highlight over this part. Um, system frequency, so this is very handy for if you want to be shooting in either PAL, NTSC or cinema. So you can switch that up in here. Um, yeah, it's a very in-depth feature to have actually, very nice to have. Uh, pixel refresh, start processing. I'm not gonna do that right now, but if you needed to do anything like that, sensor cleaning, uh, language, you can change your language. Um, if you do speak another language and you'd rather it be in like, I don't know, say like Spanish or something, then you can have that. Firmware version, this is where you find out what firmware version that you are on. And uh, it's also where you can also like, uh, activate a firmware update if you've got one saved to your SD card ready to go. Um, approved regulations. Here's um, just a, a nice little 
here it is, there's that. And uh, going down, uh, that brings us back to the top of the spanner. So we are done in the spanner. Now it is over to the little person. We've got page one, page two, page three, and then edit my menu. I guess these are like custom menu places where it's like you can add an item or something. I'm not entirely sure, actually. But I guess if we go to add, we go photo style, save. Then if I come out of that, now we've got photo style in page one. And I guess this is just like if you wanted your own little custom menu so you didn't have to go diving into these all the time to find the, the crucial bits that you find yourself constantly using, then this is a very slick and easy way to get hold of those things. And go add again. Da, 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 da. Let's go like, uh, do, 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 do. what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? But dual native ISO. Yeah, yeah, I'll have that. I'll have that in there. Um, there we go. And uh, yeah, in here, maybe. Sorting. Do, do, do. Move this, move that. No, never mind. Okay. But anyway, this is how you can just make quick little uh, menu things. So now if I yeah go into this, I can now set my dual native ISO. I'll always leave that to auto. Ooh, go back into the menu, please. So that's a very brief part of the menu, but I'm sure there's some great uses for uh, this sort of like quick menu, quick custom menus for people. And then the last but not least is the playback part of the menu. So in here, We've got our playback mode, we've got slideshow, we've got rotate display on or off. We've got picture sort by whatever means you like, file name, date or time. I suppose date or time is good so long as you're um, wanting everything to be in chronological order. You could always do it by name as well because everything is numbered, but I mean, there might be reasons as to why things might get a bit jumbled. So maybe date and time is the best way to go. I'm not entirely sure. I think both of them are pretty good. Magnify from AF point on or off. LUT view assist monitor on or off. Um, high log gamma view assist monitor on or uh, which mode you would like. Uh, just come out of that. Anamorphic D squeeze on or off. You've also got all those selections again. Uh, you know, this is for like, if, if you were to be playing back any anamorphic footage, for instance, you might want to add that D squeeze so that you're not looking at everything in like 16 by nine and everything just looking rather stretched or squeezed in. You want everything to be D squeezed so it looks very natural and you get that nice anamorphic image. Playback mode two, just behavior after video playback. So end the playback, pause at the last frame. I think pause at the last frame is pretty good. Um, it's nice to just kind of end on a thumbnail, I think. Uh, but then again, some people just probably want it to get the hell out of there, but you know. And then we bring it over to process image. So raw processing, uh, time-lapse video, stop motion, um, Protect, rating, all that stuff. I suppose this is very useful if you actually have something on a card in the camera that you can actually like do some stuff with, but you know, all that stuff. So here's like a little edit image page. So if you've taken an image, you can like resize it, rotate it, all that kind of stuff. You can even make a copy of it if you, you know, have any photos on the card that you can use this with. And then finally is others. So delete confirmation, like, do you want no to be first or do you want yes to be first? I think the safest measure is to have no first because you know if you, if you just keep pressing and you didn't really intend to delete anything, if it's on yes first, you might have accidentally hit yes instead of no, which is a lot which is a much safer option to have. And that concludes my menu walkthrough for the Lumix S5 II. Um, it really was just to give you a first-hand look at what the menu system offers in this camera. There's like a plethora of loads of different options for you to work with in this camera. Lots of very useful features. Some features you'll probably use more than others, in all honesty. Some features that are probably too technical for the majority of creatives out there. But I'm sure like with the variety of creatives that are out there in the world, there'll be some people that make more use of some settings than others and vice versa and all of that stuff. But thank you very much for um, sticking with me through this walkthrough, guys.
That brings us to the end of this Lumix S5 II walkthrough video. Please do leave a like if you enjoyed this video. If you found it helpful at all and there was any particular part that you particularly found interesting, then please do leave a comment down below. And if you have any questions as well, like do put those down in the comments too, and a member of the team will get back to you with all the information that you could need. Now, we don't like begging for subscribers on this channel, but I will say that if you are into this sort of content, then I would say please consider subscribing to this channel because this is what this channel is dedicated to, is basically just like reviewing all of these cameras, trying to give you all the information that you need so you're better informed as to uh, what, what equipment is best for you out there in the world because there's so much kit out there today. Um, but yes, uh, thank you very much for stopping by and hopefully see you again at Wex Photo Video.